Hey guys, welcome to another Murderous Heart Live. Uh, I'm just going to give it a minute to, to, to confirm sound, which I just did. Uh, oh, I want to welcome two new mods. I forgot to introduce uh, Cindy last time, but um, she goes by a summer something. I forget. Um, I forget her name on here. Uh, and then we also have Jana. She's joining us new as a moderator. So thank you, ladies, so much. If I see Cindy's uh, handle, I'll I'll say it out loud. Um, but anyway. Um, and thank you to my mods who show up for all of these lives or all the ones that you can get to. This one was interesting because, you know, I said it, I said in a couple of different lives, like I really needed to do a live about Miss Audrey Baratiero. Um, <clears throat> I've just been like so busy with school and, you know, just life. Um, so. I haven't gotten to it and then when this um i can't really call it news because it's not news if you've ever uh been to my channel before if you haven't welcome if you have you know that um my i still have a lot of report i used to be a reporter way back in the day and i still have a lot of those gravitational pulls. Um, I'm but kind of a stickler about differentiating between claims and facts because a lot of times someone will claim something and then they'll be whispered down the lane as facts and it nearly drives me to drinking. But um, those who have been with me for a while, they, they know. Okay, so so-and-so claimed this. Uh, so if you haven't seen the live that Lauren did, which I'm not sure if it was a live, but anyway, she did a video from, uh, oh gosh, um, Hidden True Crime, where she had a confidential source who claimed to be close with Audrey Baratiero, and we know that Audrey was one of Lori's friends. I will take this opportunity to uh, share the Audrey timeline because there is one, well, there are a few details, but there is one in particular that caught my attention uh, with regard to Audrey very early on. And I'll, I'll get into that. But the backstory is that supposedly a friend of Audrey's t reached out to Lauren and told her that Lori told her that she was basically there when Joe breathed his last. And, um, and so, you know, um, you know, again, it's a claim. It's not something that can be proved. However, I do find it, uh, somewhat credible because if you, um, if you were with me when I was, blogging about the case from my business YouTube channel, Analytics. I have uh, a playlist dedicated, actually I have two playlists, but I, I have uh, one primary playlist that's really dedicated to the case. And I kicked that off with a live about the pictures from Joe's welfare check uh, because a reporter had passed them on to me, which I was so grateful for. Um, and, uh, and I, um, I, I, I haven't, I need to reach out to her because now I've been forgetting her name. Uh, it'll come to me, but, um, anyway, so she had reached out to me and asked if I wanted them because she had gotten them through, um, a FOIA request. And if you hear anyone talk about FOIA, uh, that's just an acronym for the Freedom of Information Act. There is some information around these cases that the public is entitled to and some of it is redacted some of it is not shared at all arizona and idaho treat foia very differently so in idaho uh, all they have to say is it's part of an active investigation or a case and they don't have to share anything with with the public which is why we haven't gotten foia docs from idaho 
but Arizona, uh, you know, has different protocols. And so we've gotten quite a bit of uh, FOIA docs and information from Arizona because of their more generous interpretation of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so, um, so uh, Gorni Mieha, uh, she asked me like, do you, you know, some of them are graphic. I can hold those back. And I said, no, I want to see everything because I wanted to, you know, uh, Janice, Summers and I just dug and dug and dug. And we have similar constitutions in being able to process some of these kind of more gruesome pictures just to go for the facts. It's not like I'm not affected by them, but the juice is worth the squeeze for me. And so there were some indicators of foul play in these pictures. So I will also talk about that. So this live is going to I'm mostly using Lauren's live as a jumping off point uh, because, you know, obviously it was very surprising to me. Uh, I, I want to give a big shout out to uh, one of my murder mods, Amanda, because she gave me a heads up before like I started getting comments on a murderous heart and uh, email and social media channels. So uh, the detail, this new detail, it wasn't uh, alarming to me. It wasn't even particularly disturbing, but I really don't like surprises. So I was very grateful just to have that, uh, a little bit of a heads up. That said, <clears throat> you know, whoever it was who reached out to Lauren, uh, I'm very grateful that uh, she did because I do think that it informs some of these other uh, some of these other question marks and, and indicators. So having said that, uh, I want to first talk about Audrey and the overlaps of her timeline with the rest of the, this timeline. So I'm going to go through that and then I'm going to go through the pictures from the welfare check uh, on the day that Joe's body was found. Again, uh, if you already saw that live, it, there's not going to be anything new. Uh, that was a very long live uh, because there, there was a lot to get through. Obviously, I didn't share like the really graphic things. And then I did drop the pictures into uh, the, um, the Cool Cats group, um, which is now closed, but uh, I might open up, uh, like I might share them on YouTube isn't a good place to share them, but I may uh, share them on my A Murderous Heart Facebook page. I just kind of need to think about that. Um, so if I forget to share a trigger warner, warning, I think when I was going through the pictures, I think I was very careful not to include pictures where even like sometimes like a sliver of the bed is showing and and, uh, and there were some disturbing aspects to that. Uh, I don't think any of that is included, but you know, your mileage may vary. And I didn't have a lot of time to prepare this live. And uh, today was a, a really busy, crazy day. Um, so anyway, okay. All right, without further ado, um, let me share my screen. And it looks like I'm so oh, okay. All right. Oops. Okay, so Audrey first, and if one of my mods could text me and just confirm that you guys were able to see my screen, that would be great. I don't want to open my other computer because I'll get the uh, feedback. Uh, so Audrey first shows up on the scene on February 16th, a little bit 
of background on this, uh, some of these women who were part of Lori's crew went to this Preparing the People conference. It was in Boise, Idaho, and Chad was one of the speakers. So it was uh, February 16th, I think, and the, the 17th. Um, let me just see. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, anyway, so, um, so we know from this interview uh, with Serena that Audrey was on this trip. So I'm just going to play this. Was um, what about the times after? So the other time that I really remember talking to him was I'm kind of like I can't remember if I ever talked to him on the phone. We might have, but if I can't, I'm not sure about that. But I do remember talking to him at that preparing the people in February when I went to Boise, and then after. And in February, he talked a lot about like again, he described his visions of what he saw for the area. But then, like at the hotel room, he came in with all of us girls. Saw all of us girls shared the room, and it was Melanie Gibbs, Zulama, myself, and Audrey. And I don't know her last name. Um, or he was not there. Okay, her last name was Baratiero. Okay, so that's when she first shows up. The next time she shows up in the timeline that I've been curating was the day Charles Vallow was shot and killed. We know that shortly after Lori left with Ty Lee and JJ, she sent a message to Audrey. So this was at 817. The first one, the first person she texted was uh, Melanie Boudreau, her niece. And then she had just arrived at the Walgreens. We know that Tylee and JJ stayed in the car. So she probably had Tylee stay with JJ. They had first gone to Burger King. So uh, JJ was eating his breakfast. And um, right after she's on video at the Walgreens, you see here at 8.17, at that same time, so she's basically walking into the Walgreens and sends a text message to Audrey. Um, and uh, there's, uh, she deleted the message. I'm assuming Audrey did too, because she was interviewed in, at least in 2021. Uh, uh, we, we don't know if she was interviewed in, in 2020 or 2019. Um, but anyway, um, but there's no, there, there, there's no, uh, record of what that text message or text message exchange, um, what, what the content of that was, but we know that here, Lori's on the run. She's, you know, uh, not on the run, like running from the police, but she didn't have the standard behavior of waiting at the at the house you know she takes off with Tylee and JJ and Audrey is the second person she reaches out to uh she also had an exchange with um with Alex and I that that might have been that 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 might have also happened before Audrey I'm not sure I don't think uh in between the two phone phone calls between Lori and Alex, Lori and Melanie exchanged four more uh, SMS messages that were on the phone records, but not in the iCloud. So it sounds like she talked to Alex twice and talked to, or no, they had these text message exchanged with Melanie and Audrey. So clearly Audrey is on the inside. I'm not saying she had anything to do with Charles murder, of course, I'm just saying, she was a confidant. Another, uh, this is what put Audrey on my radar. So first of all, just to be fair, we see an Audrey down here. There is no last name. Uh, however, there to date has been no other Audrey uh, involved in this saga. So 
Uh, so I am going out on the limb, but not that long of a limb um, in, in saying, well, let me first give you a little bit of background here. So it's July 19th. Charles was murdered on the 11th. So it's just a little more than a week later. And Chad sent Lori uh, a message providing trust levels of those she needed to be aware of. And here you see Melanie Gibb, she was at Lori's house less than 48 hours before Charles was murdered. In fact, she invited herself over. Lori said she had all of her family and the, the kids there and it was chaos. So Lori didn't want her to come over, but Melanie just came over anyway and, um, and then spent the night. So clearly at that point, this was the evening of July 9th, Lori's, you know, absolutely frantic and consumed with this, you know, conspiracy of, you know, Charles and Adam, you know, uh, trying to turn her into the bishop to get her you know, temple recommend suspended and, you know, all, all of that. And Lori is up in arms, her whole family, you know, they're, it's the Cox family tradition to circle the wagons and Melanie Gibb is there. She gets a 97. Melanie Boudreau was one of the first people she texted after Charles was murdered and she had multiple text messages. She gets an 85 because Melanie, she kept putting stuff in writing that Lori didn't want her to put in writing. So she would be like, call me. And, but also Lori put a lot of stuff in writing she should have never put in writing. Zulema was the one who actually encouraged the murder of JJ uh, and assured Lori that she would be there to like, basically guard him and usher him uh, into heaven. Um, and after Lori, Alex, and the kids moved to Idaho, Alex complained. I mean, this was within, uh, I think, 48 hours of them getting there. Alex complained about bringing a dark portal with them. He was referring to as highly and Zulema told him, the Lord will lead you on how to uh, deal with the dark ones, something to that effect. So, I mean, all the way, she is totally down with, with murder. Lori calls her a goddess and all this stuff. And, and her encouraging, uh, or she didn't overtly encourage the murder of JJ. She validated it. She, she knew clearly that Lori wanted the kids out of the way. And she shared this prophecy with Lori that, you know, the God told her that one, uh, that, um, something might happen to one of her family members and, you know, yada, yada. Anyway, so Zulema, she was, she's one point behind Melanie Gibb, but she only gets a 96. Then there's Alex. Where was he? He murdered for her at, at this point, and he only gets a 94. And then, and Raphael, that's Chad. Like in his little fantasy, he refers to himself as Raphael. Let me hide this. Uh, you know, so he rates himself which as a 100, which like, what a weirdo dork. But... Uh, Stacy, I'm assuming this was misspelled because he really didn't know her family, but I'm assuming this is it, uh, her sister who had died years before was most likely murdered by Alex while the family conveniently was in Hawaii. Uh, and then there's Atalia. We don't know who that is. Um, but, and then Audrey. So four people get perfect scores and Audrey is on that list. And that I, I've, I've never been able to shake because to me, now this is just my thinking, you know, so this is in fact, this is conjecture. In my mind, this tells me that Chad and Lori had perfect confidence that Audrey would be an ally and wouldn't turn on them. I mean, not even Al had that, you know, and, and like I said, you know, or her, her besties, like her, the, the people who were closest to her, they, I mean, the, the closest was Melanie Gibb. And now she tries to act like she was always kind of, you know, at a distance with this. Um, no, nice try, Miss 97%. Uh, but 
but you know, then Audrey, who seems to be this minor player in this whole in this whole story, is a perfect hundred. So to me, whether it's fair or not, it tells me that Audrey had some kind of involvement, and 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 Lori is always careful to make sure that everyone's hands get dirty. So I am quite confident that there is evidence out there uh, of. Audrey that we pertaining to Audrey that we haven't seen yet because Lori doesn't rest until she makes sure everyone's hands are dirty because that's the only way to ensure people's cooperation uh, and so to me the fact that they were 100% confident that Audrey would was completely trustworthy tells me that Lori had something on Audrey and still might. So um, all I can do is conjecture as I share some of these details, but, uh, but we don't know what that is right now. Um, one thing I am doing in preparation for Chad's trial wrapping up and Idaho sharing their FOIA docs. I don't know how successful this will be, but I'm actually building out a chat GPT app on the information around this case. So uh, the FOIA docs, my timeline, uh, hopefully some of the shows like the Dateline and, and different shows like that, because you can build out like a chat GPT type app with custom data. So you can feed it PDF. So I just took a uh, a shortened version, like just 20 pages from one of the uh, uh, police reports uh, for Charles' murder. I've, I've built out um, an app and I've started asking it questions just to kind of get things going. The one hurdle I need to overcome is uh, if I'm going to use ChatGPT, you know, they have pretty stringent content filters. And so I've bumped up against them a couple of times. It's kind of like YouTube and Facebook, you know, how people are talking about having to unalive someone if they want to monetize their channel and things like that. I don't monetize my channel, so I can use the word murder. Uh, but these, um, these LLMs, they're large language models, these, these different types of apps, they have content filters. And, um, but anyway, so I'll see if that is um, surmountable. And if it is, uh, my hope is to be able to build out an app where not just me, well, like we'll all be able to ask the questions just in like normal everyday English, so what happened the day Charles was murdered? Who, you know, I've already started asking it, like, you know, who brought the bat out? You know, thing, things like that. We'll be able to ask these different files uh, questions in just like conversational English and the app will respond and even include citations and, and stuff. But anyway, so all that to say, uh, we'll, by the time all this new information comes up, I, comes out, um, I hope to have something like that up and ready and ready for prime time. Um, it, it's a tall order, a very, very tall order, but it was the main reason I went back uh, to school to study data science. Uh, and so anyway, so hopefully we'll be able to just search for names like Talia, Audrey, Raphael, you know, um, and, and some of these players. Okay, moving along. Um, and this isn't particularly interesting. I thought I closed out of this, but uh, she um, she did testify before the grand jury. She was actually the only one to be recalled. Um, so brought back the next day and asked more questions. Um, now, one thing I, I do think is interesting. So I, I pulled up, this was a couple years ago, I pulled up her LinkedIn. And I saw here that she has a master herbology certification. So focus on natural medicine and nutrition. Uh, and she described it as a program in the study of medicinal herbs 
and how to use them in the prevention of disease. It includes anatomy courses and nutrition courses. So given, again, this is, this is uh, conjecture. This is not fact, and please don't repeat this as fact, but given Lori's absolute obsession with malachite, I do wonder if Audrey potentially uh, offered consulting services on uh, natural ways to m murder people or, you know, we just, we just don't know. I just think that that uh, is interesting. Then she pops up again in October. So a little bit of background here. Uh, there had already been an attempt. The, the, obviously, Charles, he, he was already dead. He had been murdered in July. In September, Tylee and JJ were murdered. Then early October, Brandon Boudreaux was shot at. And then just then... Uh, what, like a week after he was shot at, there was a gunman um, who approached um, Tammy Daybell. And so we don't know how much Audrey knew about all of these details, but we do know that Lori did not have a filter. I've talked about that before. I mean, that, that that's part of the reason I find this claim credible because she was bragging to everyone, even six months after Joe was found dead. She shares her testimony at Melanie Gibbs' house. This is a brand new group of people, like this was her first time meeting Zulema, Thor, you know, some of these group members. And she's talking about, you know, she told the bishop, either give me a temple recommend or I'm going to murder my ex-husband, essentially. You know, so she's talking about murder even with this brand new group. So she can't, she just couldn't help herself. She's like a serial killer who collects these, you know, tokens and talks about it, but finds ways to be able to talk about it to, and still stay under the radar. And she does it, or used to do it with charm and laughing. And it's like, it, it kind of drops people's guards and stuff, but Anyway, um, and also after Joe was found dead, she, what did she do? She went to Hawaii. She takes off for Hawaii. We know that from April Raymond. And she was staying with April Raymond. And according to Anne Eliason, who was one of her friends in Hawaii, she bragged to, Lori bragged to April and another woman, I forget her name off the top of my head, that she paid Alex to murder Joe. And Joe's body had just been found. So Anne had said when she was talking with Detective Yinklin, like, you know, like, well, sometimes Lori just said crazy things. And I'm not saying this to pick on Anne. Anne was, to my knowledge, the only one who had uh, proactively reached out to police. I wish they would have reached out sooner. Uh, but anyway, but she did at least initiate contact with Chandler police where everyone else had to be tracked down by Chandler police. But anyway, so, um, so yeah, so, so Brandon was shot at and then Lori and Melanie go to Independence, Missouri, which is where Audrey lived. So she lives in Independence, Missouri, which is right outside of Kansas City. And we'll see that they flew into uh, Kansas City. And so let me back up here. All right, so uh, I wrote in these dates because I combined it. There was another uh, screenshot, but it was lower quality than this one. And, um, or maybe I just worked out the, the dates. But anyway, it says there is no screenshot of her Phoenix to Kansas City flight. However, in a delete in a deleted text messages, that's a typo. This was discovered. American has a non stop oh right. And so I already knew that Lori was in Phoenix on October 9th, the day that Tammy was supposed to be murdered. Uh, and that was the day that she um, allegedly was approached by Alex Cox and apparently the gun misfired. 
but it says here there's no screenshot of her Phoenix to Kansas City flight. However, in a deleted text message, this was discovered. American has a nonstop flight Phoenix to Kansas City Thursday uh, at 1 p.m., then fly back on Saturday. So Thursday was October 10th. It was a day after uh, Tammy was approached, and Saturday was October 12th at 6.30. Audrey said we could stay with her, but I told her we could get a hotel and she could stay with us. She will take us to all the amazing sites. So this is Lori making sure she is not in town for Tammy being murdered. So, I mean, all you have to do is apply a little bit of imagination. She and Melanie are both absolutely obsessed. The, um, what? what was it i think yeah like the day before they left for hawaii and, and these three will end up in hawaii together just like a, a week and some change later melanie tried to pick up her kids early at school and i suspect that was an attempt at custodial interference and she was going to take the kids to hawaii with her but Brandon had outsmarted her and picked them up early. So where am I going with this? I mean, Lori and Melanie were both absolutely frenetic at this point. Lori had just participated. We don't know how much, but you know, both of her kids had just been murdered within weeks of all of this happening. Uh, she was very busy trying to convince people that Ty Lee especially was a dark spirit. So they're both like very off kilter and they get together with Audrey. So you would think like if Audrey was in any way kind of a, a normal empathetic kind of person, like you would be so weirded out. Like even just with some of the things that Lori said and, and did, when I was there in May 2018, like they, they freaked me out. Like I wanted nothing to do with her after that trip. And I have shared a text exchange that I had with one of my kids where, I mean, this isn't revisionist history for me. I said in the text exchange, I think Lori, uh, I think Lolo may be a sociopath. And um, anyway, so, so, Audrey's with them while you know Melanie was just part of this whole like you know near miss of her husband being killed then afterwards he went he goes into hiding with the kids Melanie and Alex and Melanie Gibb they're going around they're doing reconnaissance with the neighbors I mean some of the details like the week of be, be, between Brandon being shot at and them going to Kansas City, Melanie was out of her mind. Like there was an interview with one couple, I can't remember their names now, but the details of this interview were so disturbing. I mean, really alarming stuff. So they were both out of their minds and you would think like this would be the point where Audrey would say, you know what? <laughs> peace out. I'm just going to kind of ride out this, this visit. Um, and then I want nothing to do with them. Like everyone is even either, either being murdered or, you know, there's an attempted murder and stuff, but no, uh, a week later after this visit, she flies to Hawaii while Lori and Melanie were there. And, if you remember or if you were part of um like the first facebook group i was in i swear i can never remember the name of it um just, just that it was bizarre um I'll, I'll see if i can find it but um i i was in this group and it was it was really interesting because it was really early on in the case it was like january february 2020 i think most of the family members uh, were were in that group and there was someone in that group who called me out I was like I know you were a part of this because I saw 
you in a picture with Lori and Melanie um, Boudreau in Hawaii. So I was like, okay, one, that's laughable. But I was like, oh, this is really good intel. So this tells me at some point, Lori and Melanie Boudreau were in Hawaii with a third person because this person thought that that third person was me. And so I always kind of tuck that away. And then a confidential source confirmed to me that Lori and Melanie were in Hawaii. This was before it was public. So, you know, I have my timeline on my site and then I have like a timeline that, that I keep that has some of these like confidential details that I, you know, either wasn't free to share at the time or still am not free to share. Um, and so, sorry, my chair is squeaky. I need to get some oil on it, but, uh, and I move around a lot, but, um, but anyway, so I knew that there was a third person and I was always curious who that third person was. Then I had the confirmation of when Lori and Melanie were there, but no mention of the third person. And then I think it was right before Lori's trial or in the midst of the trial, we found out the third person was Audrey Veritiero. So this was the, the week, um, this was the week that Tammy was actually murdered. We don't know when Audrey joined them. We do know that there was a text exchange. Uh, this was um, October 18th and the 19th. It says, deleted message to unknown recipient. Not sure how long we will be here until our work is done. And that was 1018 at 1143. That's UTC minus seven. And, um, and then later, it's at, well, oh, yes, the next bullet point, sorry. Uh, looking at Lori Vallow's phone records, this text would have been between Lori and Audrey. Uh, so we know that uh, on the 18th, Audrey, it, I guess it stands to reason that she wasn't there yet because otherwise, why would she say, not sure how long they'll be there until or their work is done, but uh, at some point we do know now that Audrey uh, joined them on that trip. And then at the trial, we found out that Audrey then flew. Okay, so let me back up. Let me stop on the Hawaii point. So I've already shared all the background, you know, um, her, her, her third husband, uh, is, is dead and, you know, uh, uh, there is a good chance that Lori told Audrey that she was there when Joe breathed his last. And then Charles is murdered after having been identified as a dark spirit. And then, you know, like in the midst of all this, there's no evidence that she has kids around because how could she be traveling all over the place with a seven-year-old special needs son? Even if Audrey believed that, you know, Ty Lee was in college, that doesn't account for JJ. And with JJ, you can't just turn JJ over to a babysitter, especially not for a, a longer trip, at least not safely. And so here she is flying all over the place and Audrey's not suspicious about that. Lori's talking about, you know, so freely about, you know, like you might be in a position where your whole family is gone. Like that's what she told Melanie's group. So she's talking all of this crazy talk and in the midst of it, all of these people are going radio silent or confirmed dead, or were almost killed. And Audrey goes with them and joins them in Hawaii. And we also know from the trial that Audrey played a role in like reaching out to Tammy and, and stuff. So she's playing an active role in this. We also know from Melanie Gibb, she was asked uh, by Nate if Lori ever talked about um, Tammy 
needing to die. And at first, Melanie Gibb like shakes her head no, and then she kind of catches herself and she says yeah, a few times she talked about uh, that um, Tammy was going to pass away. And even at that time, I, I was like flying on the plane a few times. Like she mentioned that her lover's wife was going to die a few times. And if Melanie Gibbs says a few times, it was more than a few times, most likely, because it, she has no, uh, well, no one has no integrity, but she has very little integrity. She will say whatever behooves her in, in the moment. And she has been caught in many lies. So this was her trying to kind of soft pedal things. And she was like a few times. So I think it stands to reason if she mentioned it a few times or more to Melanie Gibb and Audrey was actually with her it, when, when Tammy was supposed to be killed. And then when Tammy was actually murdered or shortly thereafter, she joins them in Hawaii. You think, okay, at this point, this has to be the point where she's like, I am done stick a fork in me i'm done these people are crazy nope she we found out in the trial she flew back to idaho with lori and melanie she said just with melanie but pretty sure they probably flew back together so then audrey is with lori and melanie in hawaii and can now confirm for herself the kids are, are they're nowhere you know and um and so, and then even with all of that, she doesn't go to police. She doesn't, she, she doesn't do anything. So, um, so the next thing I'll address is her claim in, in the trial that Lori threatened to kill her. So let's just play that. And then a woman named Audrey Baratero took the stand. She had once been part of Lori and Chad's inner circle, and she told the jury what happened when she ended her friendship with Lori. She kept to kill me. This testimony, this experience has never been revealed. She said that she would come. Oh my God. That she didn't want to have to go to be on my submission. So much blood. <laughs> Then please. Lori leaned forward on the table and stared at Audrey. She looked over to her attorney and said, I never said that. What importance did that have for the prosecution? The prosecution, I think, wanted the jurors to hear that Lori was not above killing anyone. Okay. So, um, if for this part, I'll, I'll go back to me and then I'll share my screen again, just so I'm not, you're not just looking at a, a screen of a video that already played. I really try to be fair, like in, in, in this coverage, I try to look at all sides. Um, but I personally find Audrey's uh, claim highly suspect for a couple reasons. Um, I think with some of the claims that people have made about Lori, I think, I think they've kind of operated under the assumption that because Lori has been so crazy and she was homicidal and, you know, all of these things, it, it would be believable people would just people would just believe it and we do have uh, a particularly soft spot for you know when women are emotional express duress also men obviously but i find it suspicious because you know like unless you're in the mafia yeah, or, or, or like some kind of gang. If someone threatens your life, if first of all, you're with Lori, you can now confirm her children are gone. Her third husband, gone. Her fourth husband, 
gone. Uh, Melanie Boudreaux's husband almost murdered. Then Alex died, or well, then Tammy um, is murdered. And she was with Lori and Melanie when Tammy was supposed to be murdered. She's participating and and getting Tammy to trust her to some degree. So she's acting as an agent of support for Lori and Chad's illicit uh, love affair. And, you know, all this while supposedly being like a religious person with some kind of you know, connection or, uh, to God and, and stuff. And she's, she is totally down. Like in, in all of these scenarios, we see her as this ride along even more than Melanie Gibb. And we see how complicit Melanie Gibb was because Melanie couldn't stay away from the camera. She just kept talking. She never thought anyone would keep receipts, would, you know, create trans transcriptions of videos would like, you know, create a dashboard. And I don't say this to be self-aggrandizing. I think these people, I think, you know, Colby, even in K, I think some of these people who have made claims that were later disproved or contradicted by later claims that they made or claims someone else made or uh, facts that came out in the FOIA docs. I don't think anyone thought that like same with Adam like I don't think they thought that there would be receipts and I think early on all these people felt like they owned the narrative they had all of this press coverage and and stuff and they could just say whatever they could make whatever claim they they wanted and um and and people were inclined to believe it because early on it just looked like there were two bad guys and all of these good guys who you know were just wringing their hands and clutching their pearls and you know just so disturbed by this activity and the facts aren't bearing that out so so you know her kids are gone all these people are either dead or were almost murdered and then Lori supposedly, uh, excuse me, also threatens to murder you with a very high level of violence and, and a detail about bleach. Bleach doesn't even take away evidence of, of blood. Uh, you know, any, well, never mind. I'm not going to share that one, that detail. Um, but anyway, um, so, you know, so it's just, it's, it, it's absolutely bizarre that she then wouldn't have ever gone to the police because if someone you know, just mostly had a clear conscience, like even if they were worried about like being embarrassed and stuff, it's the same with Adam, you know, like, he, you know, he talks now about, you know, having been afraid and yet no one ever reaches out to the police except for charles who was like you see with charles legitimate fear and very genuine expressions of that fear and trying to to take action now we also see him being a little cagey withholding uh, details about like whatever he knew about joe's death because he did he um he did slip and say that laurie said I'm gonna kill you too. And at that point, you know, supposedly no one was killed. This was January, 2019. But anyway, so, but at least with Charles, you see there's genuine fear and he reaches out to the police. I mean, it was all for naught. They, they weren't particularly helpful, but, but that's well, uh, an expression of what a sincere person does. What they don't do, is just keep showing up and um and so i just find it really convenient that you know she would now claim to be like afraid for her life it's not like she lived in the neighborhood you know she was she was in in kansas um so or missouri yeah uh on the near that border and so yeah i i um I don't want to be unfair, but 
I just don't find it particularly self-serving because otherwise, you know, like I think people, especially women, you know, are going to be more inclined to see an expression of fear like that. Also men, like, you know, like the reporters covering the case, a lot of times they will report uh, claims as, as facts and, and, you know, clearly express that like this, this just happened, you know? Um, but anyway, so yeah, I, um, I, I just think she had to come up with a reason for why in all of that time, not even after Alex died, do we see any evidence that she went to police? We don't know when her first contact with uh, police was that I just haven't found in the FOIA docs, but I would put money on the fact that they had to reach out to her. And to me, that, that communicates that along with a lot of these other people who didn't reach out to police, who weren't sincere or didn't, uh, behave in a way that expressed sincere concern for the kids, uh, that they just had complicity and they knew that Lori had something on them and they just prioritized, you know, their own, their own secrets and attempts to distance themselves from the, the horror of this situation, uh, instead of being an advocate for people they knew were in harm's way. So that's my opinion there. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the evidence from the pictures from the day Joe's uh, body was found uh, that indicate that I, and I had already shared in that line, uh, reasons I believe Lori was in the home. Now one isn't in a picture, but I've shared this before by trying not to operate under the assumption that you know, if you're attending a live on November 17th, 2023, you watched all of my lives. Um, so I've talked about this in other lives, but when I was there in May 20,000, uh, 20, uh, 2018, uh, Lori never told me that Joe had died. So that's strike one right there because she had my contact information. Oh, I will take this opportunity to say, uh, someone did let me know that there were uh, trolls on, um, on Lauren's live saying that I like testified against Joe or I believed, um, Lori's claims of SA. Um, and that is patently false. I've said that before one person, I saw a screenshot where one person was like, no, I'm pretty sure I, I saw that in some paper. I'm pretty sure I know who is doing this, who's sock puppet Caesar, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's absolutely, that's absolutely not true. I didn't testify uh, to that, that, that wasn't my concern. Uh, my concern was, uh, Joe's behavior toward Colby and also keep in mind that he and Lori both told me that, uh, Joe had adopted Colby. So had I known that Joe didn't actually adopt Colby, that they just gave Colby our family name. It, I just don't think that there's any way I would have testified against him because I didn't see anything anything that was alarming in his behavior toward Tylee. I've always said, you know, he adored her. And, um, and, and I also uh, put some of the onus of responsibility on Lori and, and pleaded with her to not let Joe handle discipline. Like they were just newly married and Colby was calling him dad and he was handling the discipline and he was hothead. Like, He's, you know, he is not a good person to me, like training uh, young children, uh, you know, especially someone who wasn't his child. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, patently false. All right. Um, 
right, so now let me share my screen. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I, I got off track a little bit. Um, so when I was there in May, uh, Lori pulled out this box. Um, and well, there were two boxes in her, uh, in her garage. They had, I think it was a three car garage and they were at the far end of the garage because this Phoenix in May, it was very hot. And these two boxes, I saw inside the one and it had files. Um, and uh, the other one was closed um, when we were in the, um, in the garage. But then at some point she had brought them in and, and had put them on the dining room table, had put the box on the dining room table, just the one box. And when she opened it up, it reeked of uh, decaying, body you know flesh and i never knew what uh what that smelled like but there it, it is um a horrible horrible odor and um and you know i've i've i grew up on a farm so i've come across like other animal carcasses and stuff and it was somewhat similar different but disgusting so she opens up this box and it was all of our family albums. And a, just a little bit of backstory with that. When my dad died, uh, Joe and another brother got into a huge fight because my other brother, Tom, thought we should all split up the pictures. There weren't very many pictures. Um, I didn't have pictures of my childhood. And I agreed with Tom, but Joe, he was the oldest. He was very, very controlling. And he wanted to take all of the pictures and he said he was going to, you know, um, basically digitize them. And, um, and cause he was like in it and, and stuff. And, you know, he was going to, I think like burn them to disc or, you know, something like that. Um, and he was going to distribute them to all of us and then this way we would all have the pictures well we all knew he wasn't going to do this whatever it was that he said he was going to do um that would enable all of us to have the pictures it just wasn't going to happen um but but here were those albums but they smelled horrible so part of me was like oh my gosh, our family albums, you know? Um, and because I didn't have, I, I think from my entire childhood, I have maybe 10 pictures of myself. And, um, but anyway, so part of me was drawn to these albums, but at the same time, they smelled so bad. Um, but Lori had asked me to go through and like write notes of who these people were. Well, if you know anything about me, I was, uh, we were all raised in foster care. So when it came to extended family, I didn't know who a lot of these people were. So I was texting my other two uh, then living brothers to ask them, who's this, who's this? And I only did this for maybe five, 10 minutes, came across a picture of the five of us that I really wanted. And I asked Lori if I could have that one. She was like, no, I definitely want Tylee to have that one because that has all of you. Well, Tylee, she didn't care about these pictures. Like I barely cared about like a lot of these pictures because they were family members who I either had never met or didn't remember. Uh, and I wasn't in very many pictures because I was the baby and I was only, I was just a, a newborn when we all went to the orphanage. And so, um, so I just wasn't in a, a lot of these pictures, but anyway, but after that, after she said I couldn't have that picture, I was done. I was like, okay, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So I maybe wrote, I mean, I'm guessing maybe four to six of these notes. And then I had to get away from the smell. Plus I had to get away from her because I was very angry. So anyway, um, so the fact, so at that time, Lori told me, that after Joe was found, that two police officers were at the door, at Joe's door, and said Tylee could come into his apartment and get whatever she wanted. And so Lori told me that she was like, well, she's not going in there without me. Sorry about 
the mic. Um, she's not going in there without me. So she said that they also let her go in with Tylee. No, Joe had been deceased for two to three weeks before that he was found. So I'm sure that apartment smelled horrible. And, um, and Lori even described the state of the mattress, which I won't go into those details. I did with Janice because the state that she described was how the mattress looked after they removed um, Joe's uh, body. So, um, so it was, and so she said that, uh, that Joe, like, um, that he had all of these files lined up along the, um, the wall in his bedroom. And, uh, it was like along the bed, but it was up against the wall. And she talked about like, just what a freak he was that like, you know, after all these years, he was clearly going through files about their divorce and stuff. And she said that the the police officers just let her take whatever she wanted. So she gathered up these files and then grabbed the, the photo albums. So I had no reason not to believe her at that time. Um, I, I did think it was disturbing that she would take Tylee into an apartment that you know, would have obviously smelled so bad. And, and also why would she want his, his files? Well, okay. So fast forward, what you'll see in these pictures, like one of the first things I looked for were the pictures of his bedroom to see if there were files along the, the wall, like she said, like they, they lined up, like they, um, were, uh, between the bed and the wall, or that's how I, I pictured it. Um, because they were like parallel to the bed. So I looked at that part of his bedroom and there are no files. And this box of photo albums, it it's not in any of the pictures. And they took pictures of the insides of the closets and, and stuff. So that was already very suspicious to me because, you know, I was just like, well, if, if she was there after, like if she and Tylee went in after Joe was found and police let her in, these pictures obviously were taken right when Joe was, was found. Um, and so the, the, the files would have been along the wall, like she said, but you know, at that time, again, it's kind of like some of these other family members who have just, you know, made these wild claims that were unsupported. She never in her wildest imagination imagined that one day I would be reading the police report and would have access to the photos from that welfare check. And I think there was something like 153 photos. It was like 150 something, if I remember correctly, there were a lot of pictures. And um, yeah, the, those files were, were nowhere uh, to be found and neither were uh, the photo albums. So aside from that, I'm going to share uh, some of the, some of the other pictures that had elements that to me were suspicious. Okay. Collapse that, open that. Okay, first of all, is sometimes you'll hear people say, uh, what in fact, one of um, Lori's friends at that time uh, allegedly made a claim that uh, Tylee had a key to the apartment and, um, and she was able to get her and her mom into the apartment. That is actually not true or is very, um, highly suspect, uh, because, oh, and I should have showed the picture just one second. Let me take it off the, the screen just for a second. 
Um, and let me see if I have the the picture of the the front you no you know what i'm not going to waste time with that but if um, one of my moderators or someone can remind me um i will uh throw out the the picture of the outside of the door because when you look at the outside of the door this they called it a secondary lock in the police report this is not visible at all from the outside. And I live in an apartment. I'm, I'm in Manhattan. But there are very few other choices unless you're Brook Shields. Uh, but, um, and even she lives in an apartment. I know because my daughter did her hair once. But, um, but you, you have these regulations. And so I'm pretty sure that this isn't uh, visible from the outside because he probably wasn't authorized to install a secondary lock that's that's my guess because this is a little inconvenient uh, but but i think it speaks to you know that it had supposedly been years since they had even heard from joe and that was another suspicious thing was um i had asked tylee when she had last seen her dad and I've talked about this before, but she had this kind of deer in the headlight look. And I saw her look past me to where her mom was standing. And she had hesitated, but then she said, um, she said it had been uh, about a year since she had seen her dad. But then in the police report, Lori said she had, they hadn't even heard from him for two years. So that's a big disparity. Uh, but so, you know, it, here Joe wasn't uh, supposedly in like any kind of contact with Lori, uh, and yet he still has a secondary lock. So he had moved back to Phoenix. He had been living in Texas. He moved back to Phoenix. Um, and I think not too long before he was found dead and he has this secondary lock installed and i think it speaks to just how afraid he was but it also speaks to the fact that he couldn't have just given tylee a key and you know and and then like she accessed his apartment with that key plus i don't think that he would have done that i mean if they weren't even in contact why would he give Tylee a key knowing full well that would give Lori and Alex access to his apartment. It just doesn't make sense. That's not in keeping with the mindset of someone who installs a secondary lock. Okay, another thing is the apartment, no, it could be, I mean, Joe was very, very tidy, but it was quite clear he was also depressed, you know, so, um, so I'm of two minds with some of these details. However, and I'm not going to go through all the pictures, but it does seem like the, the apartment was staged. Like here you have like heart monitoring equipment just sitting out on the sofa. There were bills like back bills just everywhere. Um, and this was a brochure for like, it, it was like an alternative to medical insurance. You know, so all these indicators of a person who is in uh, financial duress and she also, well, I can't say she also, there were also indicators throughout the apartment that he was an alcoholic because you had these wine glasses with like a little bit of wine left um, in them. But one thing that I, I will point out even from this picture, and so a little bit of background, when I first aged out of foster care, in fact, I didn't even age out, I was 17 when I left, I moved to Albuquerque. That's where Joe was. He talked me into going to school there. It was a big mistake. I really didn't know him very well because when he um, joined the Navy, I was only nine and we only saw each other for a few hours once a year when we visited our mom uh, and for a week with our dad. Um, and so, you know, I was nine when he left and uh, I only saw him one time 
um, between nine and moving in with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we we really were largely uh, strangers when I had moved in. But there was an incident where I had put a glass down on furniture and it was like, you know, kind of cheap furniture like this. I remember it was like rented furniture, but he lost his mind and he did have a very short fuse, but he could not believe that I wouldn't have put a coaster down. And I was just like, I don't know what kind of, you know, high society foster home you grew up in, but I was raised by wolves. And I, I, I think at that point I had never used a coaster. <laughs> like I was complete, that was such a foreign concept to me. And, um, and I was really young. I was like, uh, Tylee's age, I, well, well, I was a little bit older than, than, than Tylee, um, when I had moved in with him. And so, but he was just so psychotic about, well, not psychotic, neurotic. He was neurotic about how, like, if you had, you know, any kind of, uh, glass or whatever, anything that could potentially, um, have condensation it had to go on a coaster so no problem i i did that but having known that about him and i did have more you know interaction like visits and stuff with him before our falling out in uh, 2004 and he had like even come and visited us before and you know we he just always used a coaster so when i saw uh, this and and I saw it in a couple other places I was just like there's no way I mean I, I get that you know people can behave differently when they're depressed but how do you go from being absolutely neurotic about glasses having to be on a coaster to you just have like a, a wine glass I mean it could have had cranberry juice in it but whatever it's an empty used glass and it was not on a coaster and we'll see another picture uh, with that. Then there was this picture of his uh, bathroom. There were a few things it, with with this picture because one, he had activated a bottle of hair dye and you see only one of the gloves. It's also facing a weird direction. Like you think, okay, so I mean, I might be getting a little um, too detailed with this, but it, you know, it just struck me as strange. Like you're going to take the glove off and you're going to face it this way. But anyway, um, and the other glove is nowhere to be seen. So that, that doesn't really make sense. But in the police report, it noted that he had brown and gray hair. So he activated this bottle of hair dye, but then didn't use it. So it appears that something happened between the time that he activated the hair dye and, um, and using the hair dye uh, and that, that caused him to go to bed. Now, this was a really big deal to me. This is a pair of women's sunglasses. I wish I would have thought to uh, pull the picture that had uh, Joe's sunglasses because they were sitting on the kitchen counter and he always wore like the, um, like the Oakley's, you know, um, like sunglasses that kind of wrap around, like that was his style. He would have never worn a pair of uh, glasses like this that, you know, you, you could argue now would be unisex, but they're, um, they're definitely, uh, women's sunglasses and they are very much like the, the sunglasses that you see, um, Lori wearing. And here's a little better picture, uh, of them. Um, well, I don't know why it's, it's doing that. My mouse is registering it as a right click. I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, oh, come on. One second, my mouse is freaking out. Okay. Uh, here you see her. I mean, as long as I've known her, she has gravitated toward this style. She gravitates toward, um, you know, brown sunglasses with kind of a brown uh, tint. 
I have seen pictures of her with with black, but she really seems to gravitate more toward um, this style, kind of the the rounded, the brown. Um, you see, like this this picture. Well, this might be a little more black, but that still her overall uh, style, which she comes by honestly. Um, but anyway, so those were um, a big red flag to me because. You know, like even at the time, some people said, well, you could have had a girlfriend. Well, if he had a girlfriend, it stands to reason she would have reported him missing. Like no one reported him missing. No one knew that he was missing for two to three weeks. And so that's just not uh, in keeping with someone who had a girlfriend who was close enough that, you know, she would have left her sunglasses in his uh, bathroom and there was no other indicator that a woman was there. Um, so, you know, we we saw pictures of the inside of his medicine cabinet and things, things like that. Okay, I already looked at that one. Um, okay, so now moving to his bedroom. This, again, this was really alarming because when we dug into it, we started noticing, first of all, like if you look here, this is a girl's uh, duffel bag. Um, these are, you can see the pink hearts, blue, there are some green hearts, white hearts. Uh, we actually found the bag. Someone found um, the bag like being sold at like Target or, or something like that. And, you know, we we took a really deep dive into these pictures in, in Cool Cats. Um, here you see, uh, well, no, I won't go into all those details. Um, this, uh, and it's also quite apparent that Joe w had either come back from a trip or was packing for a trip. And it looks like he was packing for a trip because Again, we're getting a little bit in the weeds, but in the bathroom, there was a used toothbrush and, you know, it was clear it had been around for a while. And here you see a new toothbrush, but it's with, you know, in the same area as you see like some shirts here and here's a suitcase. And this looks like, you know, like some kind of um, jacket or something. And then there's this here and someone, uh, we weren't quite sure what this was, but it definitely looked like something that would belong to a girl and it turned out that this was a girl or you know like a female ask I'm trying to be be careful here um but it was a um a, a feminine looking iPad case cover and um so here you have you know a feminine duffel bag a feminine iPad case um I hope I didn't forget the Man, there was another picture. It, I, I, I think I, um, I might have accidentally, like I might have thought it was a duplicate and, um, and removed it. Um, but uh, the, there were like some wooden blocks, and one had a capital D, and it looked there were three blocks, and um, it looked like maybe the blocks had spelled dad. And anyway, so. It's quite apparent that it, well, I shouldn't say it's quite apparent. It appears that Joe thought he was, um, he was meeting up with Tylee because this was also like a, um, what, what do they call it? Like just a really lightweight backpack, something not like a satchel. I forgot. I can't think of what it's called right now. Um, but but he had a backpack that was sitting in the front hall. Um, so it just looked like he was gathering things and that he was under the impression he was going to see Tylee. So I do wonder if potentially Lori was able to gain access to Joe's apartment by using Tylee as a lure. And I do wonder if that is part of the reason Tylee looked so dear in the headlights when I asked her when she had last uh, seen her dad. Um, but 
but then and this this was also interesting so here you see we have two glasses here are the coasters the coasters are pushed out of the way and the two glasses are sitting on his you know little night stand or nightstand slash um dresser and as is uh, a water bottle another thing is that so janice and i went through these pictures even the the really gory ones um with a fine tooth comb and one thing we could not find anywhere was a phone here you see he has reading glasses but there's no phone and even on the bed, so they uh, they blocked the pictures of the bed, any place where his body was, we could still see like parts of the body and stuff. But Janice, um, being the eagle eye that she is, she noticed in one of the pictures, they blocked out the, the picture of Joe on the bed, but you could see him and most of the bed in the mirror. So, you know, I have a, a large iMac that's not a flex. I'm just saying these are very high resolution images. So I was able to like really zoom in and get uh, a lot of detail. I looked all through that bed and there was no phone. All right. Um, and oh yeah. And then there was this uh, glove and I, but, I wrote notes for my myself. Um, they're not necessarily, you know, pertinent to this uh, to this live. But I just thought it was weird that there was one glove. It looks like the fingers are are pulled in, like someone you know kind of peeled it off. But it was um, April when he was found, and it was Phoenix. Like it got up to the eighties, you know. So I wondered if you know. I mean, there is the chance that a detective. Um, had left it there but all through the apartment you see all of these like bills and this i i zoomed in on and it was a collection settlement offer for a bill for 153 dollars so you really see like joe was in dire uh, straits financially but why would he have then just spread these bills and like past due bills there was also like over here on the counter there was an envelope about uh it was like car insurance for high risk drivers because he had a dui and stuff but then you know here i am like zooming in on on all of these details and this was um you know almost like secondary not even secondary maybe tertiary but one time going through it, I was like, there it is. That is Joe. Here you see a water bottle. It looks like it's empty. And he has it on a coaster on the kitchen counter. So I'm like, that's Joe. All of that other stuff, like, you know, coasters being pushed aside and the glasses just being on the counter uh, or the furniture, no way that is joe like this i i, I kind of laughed when i found it because i was like i had been telling uh, janice just how neurotic he was about you know any kind of con the, the possibility of condensation you know hitting a uh, furniture but i'm like any kind of furniture but i'm like really a kitchen counter in a rental um but anyway but i i think that speaks to um yeah, that, that's more in keeping with Joe, but Lori wasn't a detail person. So it, it just seems to me like this apartment was set up to look like, hey, you know what? This guy's depressed. He's an alcoholic. There are, you know, there are empty uh, glasses that look like they had wine in them. And um, the Emmy report showed no alcohol in his system. But anyway, um, but she wouldn't catch a, a detail like that. Okay, and I shared this in the beginning of the live. I also always, uh, in every uh, description of the video, I always share a link uh, to uh, the petition. If you haven't signed it, um, I would be very grateful um, to have it signed. Does Phoenix Police care about this petition? No, but uh, I I watched enough 
true crime to see, and I've talked about this before, um, that, you know, there have been cold cases that were cold for years, sometimes decades, and someone with fire in his or her belly picks up the case and says, you know what, we need to take a second look at this case. And so, um, you know, so, I mean, who knows, it might be years after I'm gone. I don't, I don't know, but I do hold out just a tiny modicum of hope that one day someone who actually cares um, will pick up this case and say, you know what, come on, <laughs> you know, any death around the time of the rest of these deaths should be looked at, you know, including uh, the Clausen um, guy. I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I, I think his death is suspicious and should it should have been investigated but um anyway so okay um that's that's everything i have to say about that um i will um leave some time for q a and um yeah and then i don't know when i'm going to be doing another live i have considered uh picking up the timeline uh series that i was doing my only hesitation, so like those don't require a lot of prep time. The only thing is I, I just wasn't able to follow um, the trial very closely. And I know even when I was there, there were a lot of new dates that were shared um, that I haven't put into the timeline. So the perfectionist in me is like, ah, you know, I, I first need to do that, but I think I might just jump back into the timeline because I think we only made it to October before Lori's trial started. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I might do that. I'm not sure. Okay, if you have a question, uh, one thing that's really helpful is to either use like, you know, like an emoji, like a red, I know some people have used um, red question mark emoji, uh, but just putting the word question in all caps will help your question to stand out more. The other thing is if you ask a question early in the live, it's very rare that I make it back that far uh, in looking for questions because if this chat moves fast. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll look for questions here. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I had ginger snaps. That's cute. Um, yeah, my hair is, it's, it's growing out. I was uh, able to get my second haircut and it's finally at a place where I'm like, oh, I actually really like this. I might keep it short. And because it's like, it came back even thicker than it was. I also used like a, an oil, a hair growth oil, but because it wants to be so wild, like it just stays however I put it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sally. Just what I was hoping to see on YouTube. I don't know if that was in reference to the live. It might have been in reference to something else. I'll just go ahead and assume it's about me. I just read, I don't even know what it's about, but I just read, LOL, Janice is in trouble. Oh, that was for me. And uh, that was because I said, there goes the neighborhood. Oh, so when I started scrolling, it was, it started at the beginning of the live. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a good question, Francine. She asked, are there any, the chat moves fast. Are there any death investigation experts out there who can tell us how they would go about investigating Joe's death at this point, evidence destroyed, body cremated, et cetera? So I remember in 2020 when I was like digging into a lot of these details, different phone companies had different amounts of time that they kept um, digital records. And Early on in the investigation into Charles' murder, 
the someone from Chandler police did reserve uh, the records around or put in for the records around Joe's death to be uh, preserved. Uh, and in the Gilbert police report for the investigation into the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreau, uh, one of the detectives included Joe's death in the list of suspicious deaths around this case. Uh, so, so my big question was like, okay, if, if he was with one of the phone companies, like I think the shortest period of time was something like, I don't know, it was like six months or something like that. It wasn't very long at all. It was like one of the, the budget providers. And, um, and then I think it was maybe Verizon that kept the records the longest, but you know, my, my request, even when I talked to Dr. I'm not uh, Detective Johnny Myers, he's the detective who, who inherited Joe's file. Um, I asked him if they could just at least preserve his records, you know, so that like at least digital evidence um, could be uh, investigated and evaluated. I've also said, I think that there are signs in the Chandler police report of them glossing over details that I suspect were about Joe. Uh, because like there was one uh, a reference to when they pulled Lori or Chad's phone records, it said that, that there were searches for obituaries. It said like many obituaries, like he right after meeting Lori, like within a couple of days, he was searching for quote, many obituaries in Arizona. And they listed the date range from starting just like a, a day or two after, uh, after chad met lori in person so this was like october 26th 2018 if memory serves me to like the range was like something like at the end of 2019 so i was just like oh really so this date range just happens to start a day or two after he met uh lori and there were many obituaries he searched for. And then you're also going to throw more mud at it by making the date range, uh, you know, October, let's just say the 28th to whatever this ridiculous date range was. So I, I felt like they were just kind of doing Phoenix police a solid knowing that if they said, oh yeah, the day after meeting Lori or the day after like they, parted ways he searched for uh, an obituary for joe um that obviously you know his nancy drew sister would latch on to that and be like his death needs to be investigated but anyway so um yeah i i think even if someone just had access to unredacted uh, versions of these police reports, there's probably enough in there, um, you know, to, it, to investigate, even with like Lori's phone records, because early on when, when he died, like she wasn't being careful at all. And also I've been saying, and this is another point I want to make, like, so, you know, supposedly this person who knew Audrey came forward, but I've been saying all along, like you look at Lori's record for her to be still bragging about Joe and dying. And, you know, like all the things that she told Melanie Gibbs group six months after he died, you know, like she, I think she has the mindset of a serial killer where she just wants to talk about this stuff, you know, and she has no filter. Uh, and also, you know, like we see little hints, like uh, Colby said in his documentary, that ridiculous Netflix documentary, um, that uh, he was like, yeah, well, um, my mom told us all the time that she wanted Joe dead, you know, and said it in front of us. Like he grew up knowing 
his mom wanted Joe dead. Like they all did. And then he and Adam, Adam goes into detail about, you know, how the plan back in 2007 was for Alex to tease him, throw him in his trunk, take him out to the desert, shoot him, bury him, where no one would find him. I didn't know how would Adam be privy to this, you know? I mean, it, it makes no sense. They wouldn't have been bragging about a failed attempt. But then Colby also started to talk about the plan to throw him in the trunk and he caught himself. This was in his documentary and I was like, well, this, the, some of these little um, nuggets made that joke of a documentary worth worth watching um but it, you know he called himself and was like but who knows and I was like you do <laughs> like you all do you know and he and Kelsey as well as Zach Cox they were all living with Lori and Charles when Joe was found dead so I will say to the end of my time, I am 100% convinced that they all know what happened to Joe. They all know. Um, so, and I think, you know, if it's true that Lori told Audrey that she was actually there when Joe died, it really speaks to, like, she hardly knew Audrey. It's not like she knew Audrey for years from what we could tell. And yet she just had to talk about it. She had to brag about it. She had to, again, if it's true, she even had to put herself there to put all, you know, uh, any doubt to bed. Like, oh no, it was definitely murder. And I was there. Um, so anyway, so, and then, you know, she went to Hawaii right after he was found. So you know, so then, and then there she is in Hawaii bragging that she paid her brother to kill Joe, who also just happened to be dead, you know, so like, all these people just dismissed this stuff and, you know, didn't reach out to law enforcement. But I think all of these people, I think April Raymond, I think everyone she bragged to, I think they know exactly what, maybe not exactly what happened, but I think they know that he was murdered and 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 how and I remember I only talked with Kay Woodcock one time and this was maybe February 2020 uh, she and Larry were coming to New York City they wanted to get together but I was really sick at the time and um, and so we talked on the phone and there was one point in the conversation where she said, Annie, I know they killed your brother. And then she repeated herself. And I'm not adding undue weight or emphasis. She said, I know they killed your brother. And she said, but I can't talk about that right now. I can't focus on that right now. I need to find my baby. So even at the time I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> like you, giving me more detail how you know this like that's not going to get in the way of finding jj you know it was just and even at the time i wasn't sure if it was like hyperbolic if she was just being emphatic like i just know in my heart of hearts they killed your brother or if it was no i actually know they killed him and when some of these details started coming out even with charles you know um saying and she said, I'm, I'm going to kill you too. I, I think, I think that there's a very good chance that, uh, even Kay knows that Joe was murdered and, and, and what happened because it would have contributed to Charles fear. You know, even the one thing I will somewhat give Gabe Bonilla a little bit of latitude with was he had told the detective uh he said well he, char meaning he meaning charles he didn't say lori would kill him she he said that she would destroy him so you know i mean i was just kind of like all right we're do we mean to split hairs over this? But I do think that there is a good chance that he's telling the truth about that 
And I didn't find him particularly dishonest. I had found him particularly cowardly. He did nothing to help Charles and completely downplayed um, Lori's, you know, bizarre statements and just what she did um, to torment him. But that being said, I, I do think that, you know, there is a good chance that Lori said, I'll destroy you. But part of the reason Charles interpreted that as murder was he knew she was capable of that. Okay. All right. Uh, Iris asked what happened with all the stuff in the apartment. It was destroyed. So they, it said in the police report, I think this was the police report. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that they were holding off on processing the apartment until the Emmy's report came back and when the Emmy's report came back that Joe died of natural causes they um they just got rid of everything in the apartment and I mean they would have had like the apartment complex would have had to um, really like deep clean that apartment I just happened to have uh, a former client who that's what they did like they came in and uh, cleaned up after murders and suicides and that's how I knew that you could make blood undetectable um, to uh, black light and luminal but anyway um so because they had to do that like in apartment I mean um, not apartments uh, in hotels because people bring black light to hotel rooms so if someone you know um, can you know if someone dies in a, in a hotel room and there's blood they need to get rid of any evidence that there had been blood okay um so they just got rid of everything oh <laughs> uh, dr von decay asked how my classes are going they're going really really well um uh, yeah they yeah I probably should hold off until I'm finished the school to like work on some of these side projects like the app but um but yeah I'm so glad I I did this program and when I got the diagnosis I had considered just putting school on hold because I was diagnosed just two months after starting but I don't know I I, I just thought well I'm I'm going to keep going as as much as I can and you know, so I, I had to get like a couple extensions and professors were really understanding. But yeah, I've, I've learned so, so, so much. And I'm also able to, to use it professionally. Uh, oh, um, Jkid asked, whose death did you say uh, should be investigated? Um, Eldon Clausen, I think his name was. It was an unusual name. I, I'm pretty sure it was Eldon Clausen. So he was a, a neighbor. Um, he lived in the, the same neighborhood as Chad. And there was one point, now this I can't pull out of Cool Cats, but I'll just anonymize uh, things as much as possible. So there, there was a group of people who lived in that neighborhood and they were in Cool Cats, that's the Facebook group that I've since shut down because it's mostly just sock puppets trying to get in. And, um, but anyway, so there was a, a group of, of people who lived in that neighborhood and I had reached out to them at one point, just in a, a group message and said, you know, because we were, I had a post about Eldon Clausen and why I think that he was one of uh, Chad and Lori's victims. And these people had commented. And so I reached out to them in this group message and said, hey, um, if there's anything that you would be willing to share that will be anonymized, like no one will even know who was who participated in this group um, but you know at that point um, people they they have a pretty high level of of trust like I I just would never rely about something like that and also um, I 
you know, there's with, I always share, or, well, I don't always, if someone says, please keep this just between the two of us, I obviously don't share that with Janice, but anything that, um, like people, I, I don't want people to have to trust me too much. Um, I don't want them to have to take my word for it. So I could understand the difficult position Lauren was in by trying to explain like the steps that she took to, you know, try to verify this claim. And, you know, people just kind of have to trust that she is being honest about the steps that she took. So all that to say, I, I reached out to this group and I said, if there's anything that you would be willing to share that's anonymized and, you know, gave them my word, like no one will ever see this, you know, this group uh, message and, and stuff, uh, then I think it could be interesting to share kind of a, a cumulative post. Uh, these are details from neighbors and, um, and, so they did, and wow, the details that they shared, uh, it wasn't just that he, so Eldon Clausen was kind of this self-appointed keeper of the water supply. And I wasn't familiar with Idaho water laws and, and how like, I guess, you know, it's a pretty bucolic area and different, properties were assigned different days where they the water could be like directed to them or you know something like that well eldon appointed himself as kind of the um the water czar and would walk along these different like river banks and and um and like streams even and and, and make sure that someone hadn't like rerouted the, the irrigation or, you know, however that works. I don't remember all the details because now it's been a little while, but anyway, but he would, he, uh, as the story goes, he would walk along Chad's property line, I think every morning or almost every morning. And it was like where that little ditch is. And, um, and that was where um, JJ, was buried it was like by he would have passed by that tree and so if he just happened to pass by that tree uh, either while they were burying jj or even just like immediately afterwards like he could have been suspicious that something the ground had been disturbed and what did he bury and could it compromise the water and and stuff but there were also allegations um that this guy was uh, he was a, according to some of these allegations a bit of a scoundrel like he would take note of who was in i think there were like three services sunday services and he would uh, there were allegations by some of these people that he would take note of who was in church and then i think during the second service would like break into people's homes and like take meat from their freezers and you know stuff like that you know there's no way to confirm this but um but he was seen as a, a bit of a nuisance and um anyway as the story goes uh chad had lunch with him the same week that he died and uh, which was also right when JJ was murdered. It was like right after JJ was murdered. I mean, I have all the details in my timeline. Um, so I don't, I now don't remember all of those details off the top of my head, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, and you know, again, as the story goes uh, among the neighbors, uh, a lot of the neighbors suspected that um, Chad had something to do with that, or at minimum that his death needed to be investigated, and it it wasn't. So um, the, there was also like a fam one of his family members who was really upset about like anyone even saying his death needed to be investigated. I think that like people said that he was part of 
like Chad's little group. And so there may have been embarrassment over that. There may have also been concerns about what could come out about some of Eldon's alleged um, misbehaviors. And, um, and this person was going in the groups and telling people they needed to stop talking about it. And I just made it very clear because I saw that this person had joined Cool Cats and you know as graciously as possible i was like just so you know no one comes into this group and tells me what we can and can't talk about so it wasn't like a flex but it was just like if you're coming into this group and i just like addressed it in the group in general like you know if you're joining the group in hopes that you'll be able to influence or what we talk about that that won't happen and you won't be welcome in the group so uh anyway um uh and murray asked if i watched uh, a hidden true crime um podcast about audrey i so to be honest no i, I watched the first few minutes uh, and then i just i kind of you know i in so like I just had this really really big client project and I've been burning the midnight oil that's why I just happened to be up when uh when Amanda reached out to me <clears throat> excuse me but I had been so busy and um and I there wasn't an indicator of when she was actually going to start talking about that and I mean no disrespect to Lauren but I was just like could you give me I asked Amanda could you give me the too long didn't read version so Okay. Um, uh, Margaret. Margaret asks, was the box of photos ever found in Lori's effects after the arrest? No. In fact, I don't know why I didn't think of this when I was there and it asked for the picture, but I think I was on my way home or I had just gotten home and I was like, oh my gosh, why didn't I just take a picture I would I had been taking pictures of these pictures and sending them like to my brothers to ask who people were so I was like why didn't I at least take a picture of that picture of the five of us together I was really mad at myself I think I just was like so disturbed by her telling me no and I was just like I'm done I'm done with the smell I'm done with everything uh but I reached back out to her I texted her and asked if she could scan the um uh, the that picture in and send it to me because I kind of like made a mental check of a mental note of uh Charles office he had a home office and I had helped him with a couple a couple of excel issues he was having so I was in his office and I was like I'm pretty sure the printer in his office was also a scanner so anyway I just asked her if she could scan that picture or you know even I would have been fine even just having a picture of the picture and she said that um, she no longer had the picture so I suspect that she just kept that those photo albums just to I I think she got off on you know watching my discomfort and um, so I know some people have asserted that maybe she was having me write down the names of people who had passed so like she could do like baptisms on their behalf i don't know i don't i don't really um understand all of that but yeah but it was clear i left and she got rid of the pictures either that or she just wasn't even willing to send me the picture who knows uh okay oh um ah thanks <laughs> gee the bird nerd oh my gosh so some of these names are so funny she said oh, I, I love the timeline series yeah it, it was a painstakingly detailed uh, look at the case but even just in preparing for it i would make connections i hadn't made before because I, you know, I was kind of like, it, like finding dates was like my catcher in the rye. You know, if I saw any 
like either an article or a FOIA doc or like um, Justin Lum was releasing a lot of you know different documents even before the FOIA document dumps and stuff I was just always on the prowl for for dates and then I would add them to my timeline but I very rarely then just went back over because this timeline is like thousands of words now I forget I at one point I actually pulled it into word and looked at the word count and it's basically a book um but a lot much longer than a lot of the um, group members um, books and people around this case writing these books and you're just like okay it's like there's nothing to this book but anyway um so um yeah, but there were connections I made in even just preparing for uh, those lives that I was like, whoa, that happened on the same day as this other thing. Um, uh, okay, just kind of flipping through here. Um, Ellen asked, did Lori ever talk to you about Oh, entering Joe's apartment. I think app is app is short for apartment. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think so. Um, while Ty Lee was present, did Ty Lee corroborate any of Lori's claims? So Lori told me that two detectives or two police officers let her and Ty Lee into uh, Joe's apartment. So uh, but that there's no mention of that in the police report and they certainly would have added that I mean even when like detective Moffat would like attempt to call someone even if he didn't get an answer it would be noted in the the police report um so yeah that absolutely would have been uh, included so yeah, and Ty Lee didn't say anything. Ty Lee was when we talked about, uh, like when I asked her about when she had last seen her dad. I've talked about this before, so I won't go into the all the details, but she just kind of hovered. Uh, but it was like a room, almost like a room and a half away. So there there was the, um, the kitchen and then like a like kind of a an open not a formal living room there was a, a separate room for that but you know kind of a, a great room and then the, a dining area and then there was a like a more formal dining room and the dining area was in front of the kitchen so you know imagine the the dining area is here and then the great room is here and then the hall is down here off of the the great room and the kitchen the kitchen's like here it was a really big kitchen and um and and ty lee would hover near the hall but she would just stay there so Lori and i would be talking quite a bit either in the kitchen or in in, in this particular interaction we were in that dining area um and you know and she 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 would just hover um so yeah so she didn't confirm anything she just she was just there but she was there and in eyesight enough that i you know i had asked her that one question thank you katie that's very that's very kind oh um thank you dr bondake she said she signed it today. I'm assuming that's Joe's petition. Um, uh, Denny, yes, I wonder the same thing. He or she wrote, uh, I, I wonder if they could go back in time to go through his phone records. Lori could have texted him to see Ty Lee, probably way too old to see his records. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, and Justine and I agree, the missing phone is, is crucial. The only thing that I can make any kind of allowance for would be like if he had it 
in the bed with him and it was like covered up by a sheet or blanket or something. Yeah, Denny. Yeah, exactly. Just like she took Charles' phone. Yeah, Paige, I agree. She said all the victims were failed in so many ways by so many people. I mean, honestly, like the story is really sad, but to me personally, it is the saddest aspect of the story. When you find out the details that are in these documents and then you compare them to the claims that people made and even some of the things that they said trying to put their best foot forward and you're just like wait what like why why wouldn't you have done this and it's not a case <clears throat> excuse me it's not a case of you know woulda coulda shoulda i just don't feel that it is i feel like you have multiple people who were talking supposedly talking to each other about how off the rails Lori was you have people who were sending text messages to law enforcement emails talking about how worried they were and and stuff and then when it comes down to to the detail like details that really really matter they just they just weren't shared. Like the fact that Lori was having an affair with Chad. Nobody told law enforcement about that until after Tammy's murder. Nobody. They all knew. Nobody told law enforcement that Tylee was rated a dark spirit. Even when they knew Tylee was missing, that was only shared with the media after the case went public. There is no record of that those ratings being in the the FOIA docs anywhere and they wouldn't have been redacted because by the time the FOIA docs came out that had been shared publicly like more than a year earlier so there wouldn't have been any reason to redact it it just wasn't in there you know and so I mean yeah it's I know I sound like a one trick pony when it comes to that, but it is a, one of, it is the thing that bothers me. I mean, aside from the fact people are murdered, it was, a, it's the detail that bothers me the most because these were very unsophisticated, unsophisticated criminals. Like they should have been caught so many times, but you have people withholding details, sending police on wild goose chases, um, not reaching out to police, and then coming up with all these revisionist stories for what, oh, the police didn't contact me for three months. Oh, no, well, maybe it was a month, you know, and you know, all these details. And, and then, like, even when they get in contact with police, like, you would think, these people, if they had sincerity, any, and like even a modicum of sincerity, they would have passed on all the evidence that Charles had been giving them about, uh, you know, the evidence of Lori's affair with Chad. And Kay was like, I don't know, I had, maybe she's going to find her next in Hawaii. What she's been with her next all, all this time. And you knew, you know, so why are you talking about her finding her next in Hawaii and you know and then she said she didn't know Chad's name you know and all, all of these really unexplainable um omissions and that um yeah um and they, they even carried over to the the trial because we know from the uh the Amazon one Amazon receipt being passed on to Nate Eaton um, and that uh, Lori's ring, she, well, someone ordered Lori's wedding ring the day Brandon was shot at. And then it was delivered on, I believe, October 7th. So this was, this, this was a good week and some change before, almost two weeks before Tammy was actually murdered. Also, Rich Robertson came forward with an absolute 
bombshell. And it just kind of fell on deaf ears because he said right before the trial, he was interviewed and both the interviews were contained bombshells. I mean, and I don't use that word lightly, uh, but he had said in, in one of his interviews that Charles had shared all of his logins with Kay and including the login to his Amazon before he was murdered because he was worried about his his safety. So she had all of these logins and then he added that they were watching Lori's transactions in quote real time. So this whole story that like she didn't she found the receipt by plugging Charles printer into her computer and you know all this it, 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 well first of all that that's impossible you don't you don't get passwords from that you don't you know that doesn't give you access to sites behind a, a paywall or firewall um that just doesn't happen but she already had the login info for his Amazon account and they were monitoring these purchases in real time. So we don't know when Rich was hired. So we don't know when this real time started, but it certainly wouldn't have been after they were already married. Um, and he also said that they saw that some of the purchases had been sent to Hawaii. I mean, so anyway, I mean, if it was before October 19th, um, which would have been real time, you know, if, if, if Kay had seen like the wedding dress, the wedding ring and all of those things and, and had known that, you know, Chad was married to a woman, like she could have saved Tammy's life. So uh, I do look forward to some of these details um, being shared in the FOIA docs because there are big gaps in the timeline. Okay. Find Summer's Truth. That is, um, I, I couldn't remember uh, your handle, um, but I mentioned it early on. That's my good friend, Cindy. She's a new moderator. Okay. Uh, I'll answer a couple more questions and then I'll call it a night. All right, let's see. <laughs> Miss Macy. <laughs> no, I wish I were Sherlock Holmes. But there are times when, you know, like you're going through and you're digging through like photos or like the FOIA docs. I mean, I read every page of those FOIA docs. And then sometimes you're just reading along and you're like, wait, what? There would just be these uh, revelations and it would just be like in a, a sentence, you know, or I would get confirmations of what confidential sources had told me, like that Melanie Boudreau, and I had shared this before I found it in the, or, you know, even before the FOIA docs were released, I believe uh, that she had, um, she had gone to Idaho and, um, and yeah. And then I, I found the reference in the, the FOIA docs of the dates that she was there and then saw in the next sentence, like this was just days before Brandon was murdered. And so she's in Rexburg obviously at this point, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but if you've been following the case really closely, the kids had already been murdered at this point. This was the end of the September. And it said that during that span of time that she was there, that Lori, Chad, and, um, and Alex were planning Brandon's murder. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> like, what, what, what hold do these women have on you, you know, on, on law enforcement? Like, what do they think that Melanie was doing there while 
Lori, Chad, and Alex were planning her husband's murder, the murder she stood to profit from, and she just happens to be there while, you know, Alex is getting his windows tinted. I mean, this was the same week, you know, she's there, he's getting his windows tinted, they're, they're meeting up, you know, they're, they're making all of these plans and they're like, yeah, yeah. And, but it was the previous sentence that, that said the, the date said she was there. So anyway, so it, it is kind of wild, like just going through some of these documents or even just like sometimes re-listening to body cam footage or some of these shows and something jumps out at you. And it really does feel sometimes like what you see in the movies, you know, you just see someone who's like obsessing over these details and then they're like, wait. But I'm also so grateful for all of the people who have hooked arms and have spent time, you know, and like, you know, either talking with me through some of these theories and stuff, because I'll throw this out to some of them, you know, some of these ideas out to some of my closest friends, <clears throat> excuse me. And sometimes they'll, they'll find, they'll think of something where it's like, well, no, that, that couldn't have happened because so-and-so was out of town at that time and, you know, or, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, it, it's been amazing. And also some of the posts that, you know, we would put out when Cool Cats was active, um, like, you know, sometimes I would just say, let's just do a, a knowledge dump on, on someone and everyone, it was like stone soup. Everyone would just drop everything that they knew about, let's just say the Zulema. And then I would go through those and I'd be like, oh, I never saw this screenshot or, oh, I didn't know this detail, or maybe I had forgotten. And again, then if it had a date or even just some kind of corroborating information, I would add it to the, the timeline. <laughs> T. Dotton. I, at first, I couldn't in, interpret how to read it. I hate it when people call me when Annie's on. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. <laughs> Teddy. No, my daughter didn't date book shields. She uh, was one of the, the stylists um, who, like, as I think someone was doing Brooke's makeup and um, my daughter uh, was doing her hair. But the funny thing is, like, so these celebrities, when they order these services through this company that she like contracts with, and now she works at the New York Times, but like during the day she, you know, works in my field and then at like nights and weekends, um, she does like vintage hair and makeup and hair for weddings and, and stuff like that. And then sometimes, uh, you know, it's like she, she has done hair for celebrities and stuff, but they all always use a pseudonym. So you don't know you're going to Brooke Shields apartment. But the funny thing was the woman who was doing the makeup, she, I think she said to my daughter, like, do you, she was like, this is Brooke Shields. And my daughter being a millennial, she was like, who's Brooke Shields? So the, the other makeup artist explained who she was. I just thought it was funny. <clears throat> but, um, okay. Uh, I'll take one more question and then, um, let me go to bed. Um, Oh, <laughs> someone said something about my glasses. I love wild glasses. I think I said in a live once, like, I just get them from Zilu. It's a weird name. It's hard to say, um, but they're very affordable. You just buy them online and I just have my, uh, I, I just need them for a reading. And um, yeah, I, I just, 
I just have my prescription on file and I'll buy them when I just need a, a little uh, face candy. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'll check in the beginning. I, I think I've just like missed the community. I, I, I normally haven't been doing this long of um, Q and A's, but I just miss you guys. And I, I've said this before, but I really enjoy going back through the chat. And now I do it the same night in case, God forbid, the um, the the video is taken down. Um, but in the event that it is, I now also publish to a Murderous Heart Facebook page. So if this video goes missing on YouTube, Facebook has a much uh, better system. So I will get notified that someone has reported one of my videos, but to date, they, they've never been taken down. So. Okay, yeah, I'm not finding any more. Uh, question with um oh i'm going to take a screenshot of this i'm not sure how to pronounce your name micah m-i-c-h-a um micah don but he or she wrote suggestion detective ken Maines. i've never heard of him uh will take cold cases if a family contacts him he's legitimate youtube channel unsolved no more uh, someone get this info to Annie. Well, someone did. You. Thank you. So, all right. On that note, I'm going to bounce. Um, but thank you again for joining another live. And if I um, can swing, uh, getting back to the timeline series, obviously, I'll announce it on the community <clears throat> um, board. But uh, yeah, this was really the, the last live that I wanted, like a topical live that I wanted to cover. There is one more that I considered doing, um, but if I do it, it will, it will kick up some dust. So I just have to assess if I'm willing to take that on. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll see. Anyway, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you somewhat soon. Bye guys.